Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. This is a 57-year-old female with a history of abdominal pain. I'll give you a chance to look over these images. That's from the bottom up, and now we'll go from the top down. Give you a chance to kind of get an overview of what's here and maybe pick up an abnormality uh, or two if they are present. Okay, so starting from the top, my routine for going through a CT of the abdomen and pelvis is I say liver, spleen, and pancreas, and I look through each one. So here's the liver, and I run through the liver. Oh, I see a little tiny low attenuation area here that looks not quite round, but still could be just a simple hepatic cyst. Can't be sure it's not something else. We could do an ultrasound to correlate that to see if it's a cyst. <clears throat> liver otherwise un the liver otherwise appears unremarkable. Here's the spleen. The spleen appears within normal limits. We can see the splenic vein going toward the splenic hilum splenic vein being posteriorly positioned relative to the pancreas. And here we can see pancreas. Let's see if we st start at this lower point here. You see the uncinate process of the pancreas. That's immediately behind the superior mesenteric vein. And we follow that superiorly and we see more of the pancreatic head. And then as we go up more superiorly, we see the body and tail of the pancreas, both coursing toward the left upper quadrant, the spleen in this case being positioned fairly typically in the left upper quadrant uh, laterally. So liver, spleen, and pancreas appear normal, and that's a list of items that we go through, and those are the first three I usually do. Liver, spleen, and pancreas appear normal. And as I say it, I look through each one sequentially as we just did. The gallbladder, adrenal glands, and kidneys are next. The gallbladder here has some abnormalities. If you look, you see a little tiny round punctate, little high attenuation focus that's adhering to the wall of the gallbladder. That looks like a polyp. This looks like another polyp. They're not falling to the dependent aspect of the gallbladder, so they're not clearly gallstones. They don't have calcium, which I would expect occasionally in gallstones. Gallstones are, are, are not always calcified. In fact, generally are not calcified, but they can be calcified. Gallbladder wall doesn't look thickened, so Again, there now we, we have gone through liver, spleen, and pancreas, gallbladder, adrenal glands. We've got to look at the adrenal glands now, and they are superomedial to the kidneys. And so here's the right kidney. And if we go superior and look medially and somewhat anteriorly, we see this looks like a wishbone kind of configuration, two adjacent lines that can be spread out. Here on the left, you can see kind of an upside down Y configuration. That's the left adrenal gland. Again, it's superior to most of the kidney at least, and anterior as well, superior anterior, and a little bit medial to the upper pole of the kidney. So here we have again, normal thin limbs of the adrenal gland. And then on the left, we have a little different configuration, but everything looks thin. I don't see any nodular or mass-like component to it. So the gallbladder and adrenal glands appear normal. And then the next line is the, the gallbladder, the adrenal glands, and the kidneys appear normal. And in this case, the kidneys do not appear normal. The left kidney appears normal. <clears throat> but the right kidney 
does not. In the right kidney, you can see that there's this area of abnormal low attenuation, which is really low attenuation because it's not enhancing as well as the rest of the normal kidney on the right side appears, and the left kidney has nice uniform enhancement throughout the renal parenchyma of the left kidney, whereas on the right we have this low attenuation area, which is diminished enhancement in the upper pole of the right kidney laterally. Addition, additionally, we have something, another finding right around where, where we're seeing this low attenuation abnormality in the right kidney. You can see there's loss of the clarity and the low attenuation of the fat. So there's stranding of the perirenal fat. And here you see how it looks kind of gray in there. Look closely, it looks kind of gray in here, right here. And you compare that with over here, the fat adjacent to the left kidney is black. Very low attenuation, uniform in low attenuation. So we have a low attenuation area of diminished enhancement in the right kidney with adjacent stranding of the perirenal fat. Take note of the terms that I use to describe that. So a low attenuation area in the upper pole of the right kidney consistent with diminished enhancement with perinephric stranding of the fat or stranding of the perinephric fat. What could that be? This is a typical appearance for infection. So this is pyelonephritis. Now, the fact that you have a focal area of low attenuation and abnormal enhancement in the upper pole of the kidney reflects the inflammation and edema that's in there that is probably preventing the normal vascular perfusion of this area of tissue. And that stranding, or rather that inflammation, extends into the perinephric fat, producing the linear stranding, which is really edema or fluid that's coursing through the uh, tissues of the perirenal fat on the right. So pay close attention to this strandy, distinct, kind of dirty looking pattern in the perinephric fat and compare it with this sharp, black, uniformly low attenuation that we see on the left, which is typical of normal fat. So there we have a finding so we've now gone through the liver, the spleen, and the pancreas appear normal. And here we see the pancreas here, here, and curving around into the pancreatic head and the uncinate process. The gallbladder we saw little polyps in. The adrenal glands looked okay. Adrenal gland here, adrenal gland here. And left kidney appear normal. The right kidney shows a low attenuation area of diminished enhancement in the upper pole, uh, very suspicious for focal pyelonephritis. I would specify focal pyelonephritis because very often pyelonephritis involves the entirety of a kidney and sometimes the entirety of both kidneys. So there it is, liver, spleen, and pancreas gallbladder, adrenal glands, and kidneys. So having that pattern of going through one structure after another allows you to check off each structure that you need to be worried about. And those are the major organs, so that in terms of solid organs. And then we look at the bowel and see if there's any dilated or fluid-filled bowel or any other sign of obstruction. There is not. And then in the pelvis, we see this large mass here, which kind of is bilobed. And this is a female. So this is a typical appearance, or not uncommon, for uterine fibroids or a fibroid uterus. I prefer that term, fibroid uterus, because it looks like the uterus in general has been deformed and enlarged by this process. So it's a fibroid uterus with fibroid changes 
this may be one big fibroid, this may be another one here, or there could be just infiltrated fibroid changes involving the substance of the uterus with an asymmetric distribution of those findings. Now that we're in the coronal plane, we can take another look at this abnormality of the right kidney. This is a focal low attenuation area indicating diminished enhancement. So here you see the nice white, bright appearance of enhancing renal parenchyma, renal tissue, whereas here you have a defect, which is an area of diminished enhancement in the upper pole of the right kidney laterally with stranding of the adjacent perinephric fat. And here you see a lot of the grayness, the gray appearance, the, sh the shaggy or linear strandy appearance of the fat in the perinephric fat on the right that is in gross contrast to, to what we see on the left, which is uniform, low attenuation, nice, dark, uniformly low attenuation fat. In the coronal plane, we can see the portal vein coming nicely from the upper abdomen into the liver. The portal vein is comprised of primarily inflow from two major veins. One is the superior mesenteric vein. The other is the splenic vein. The splenic vein can come in at a variety of angles, and it all depends on where the spleen is. And in this case, the spleen is pretty up, pretty far superior because the splenic vein will generally go straight toward the spleen. So here you can see the splenic vein coursing up like this and a little bit of tortuosity but it goes right to the splenic hilum and the spleen is positioned high in the left upper quadrant in this patient. It can be more posterior, it can be more lateral, so it is variable but you should be able to identify the splenic vein by being able to trace it to the spleen. So you have superior mesenteric vein and you have the splenic vein forming this confluence, which is the portal vein. And the portal vein then enters the liver and there is a right and a left portal venous branch Also referring to the liver, if we see, if we look up here, we see that this is the inferior vena cava coming into the right atrium with its deoxygenated blood to go to the right ventricle and then to the lungs to become reoxygenated. So we know this is deoxygenated blood coming from the inferior vena cava. And notice that the inferior vena cava does course partly through the substance of the liver here. And it is primarily formed at least at the level of the liver, it has very substantial contributories from the hepatic veins. And you have a right, middle, and left hepatic vein. So you have right, middle, and left hepatic vein. And they converge on this inferior vena cava, which is getting, in this case, the deoxygenated blood coming from the liver that goes into the inferior vena cava. And that goes to the right side of the heart, of course, to become reoxygenated with passage through the liver, I mean through the lungs. And this is the portal confluence on the, in the axial plane. So what we saw here as the splenic vein and superior mesoteric vein coming into the portal vein on the coronals, we can appreciate here, but it looks a little different So here we have mesenteric vessels, and this is a mesenteric vein, and we follow that up, 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 and posterior to the pancreas, it joins the splenic vein, which we know that the splenic vein has a very close association with the pancreas, and it goes off in that direction. So the superior mesenteric vein from below, and the splenic vein from the left side of the abdomen 
or superior left side of the abdomen together form this portal vein which goes into the liver and has drainage pathways into the liver that are comprised of the right and left portal vein and then you have hepatic veins which are draining blood from the liver that are converging on the inferior vena cava. Okay, so this is a case of pyelonephritis with perinephric stranding in a patient with what are probably incidental uterine fibroids or fibroid changes of the uterus.